a woman stands alone. Shrouded in black, her failed face fills the frame. Passive, motionless. Her face may be concealed, but we read the clues and piece together what her story might be. We imagine she has much to say, but the oppressive black cloth renders her mute. The silence is deafening. Images like these are face failed or niqab wearing women and the way in which we've been taught to read them have become a blueprint for how we perceive Muslim women in the Western imagination. Recycled stock images of black, passive figures with no name and no context accompany negative news stories related to terror, oppression and increasingly articles with reductive punchy headlines like Ban the Burqa. Together, they position veiled women as both threatening and oppressed victims. These contradictory narratives are so prevalent that we've been conditioned to link Nikabi women with negativity without question. As a Muslim woman myself, I found this ongoing discourse frustrating and decided to create the Daily Veil. I felt that how the Nikab was photographed, presented and spoken about was ironically in itself oppressive. News coverage was repetitive, focusing on the same unhelpful, for and against arguments, which rarely included the voices of women who actually wear the niqab. And when well-intentioned journalists did include their voices, they were trapped in a paradigm which reduced them to their clothing, only serving to dehumanise them further. The real purpose of those pieces, to me, felt like Muslim women had to justify their choices and prove that they hadn't been forced to wear the niqab, based really on an inherent presumption that Muslim women are not active in their own choices. Despite the small numbers of women who actually wear the niqab in Europe, the continuous nature of these debates leads us to falsely believe that the niqab is a growing trend among Muslims. In reality, niqabi women are a minority within a minority and the focus on them is disproportionate. The undertone, in my opinion, is an extension of what Bernard Lewis crudely called the clash of civilizations. I was also disturbed by how readily politicians and feminists co-opted the narrative that the veil was oppressive. For example, in France, where a ban was enforced in 2011 following countless hours of public time and resource, when only 0.00058% of the population wore a niqab. President Sarkozy, whose administration brought in the ban, said that veils oppress women and were not welcome in France. I wondered where his concern for women was when I learned that France has one of the highest numbers of femicides in Europe. It's estimated that a woman is killed by her partner or former partner every three days. Where is the public and parliamentary discourse about this issue? Instead, there is a focus on divisive narratives about Muslim women and their clothing choices. Despite such bold statements being made about the niqab in the public domain, Google Trends data shows that underpinning the debate is a lack of basic knowledge about what veiling actually is. This isn't surprising, considering the people I spoke with during my research, including Muslims, most had never spoken to a veiled woman. So inevitably, people turn to Google for answers. This is in itself problematic, considering you only need to Google the words niqab or burqa to see a long list of articles appearing from why I hate the burqa to let's face it, the niqab is ridiculous and the ideology behind it weird. Google Trends data I studied showed spikes in online searches coinciding with burqa ban news with people asking questions such as what is a burqa and how to make a burqa right the way through to why should the burqa be banned all demonstrating that the media are simply not providing supporting context to readers. When considered alongside data that shows in Britain, for example, that 81% of the public would like face failing banned in schools and hospitals, and 57% would like to see a full burqa ban in the UK, it's worrying that these opinions are being formed without sufficient information. Also, considering that veiling is linked exclusively with Islam in the mainstream narrative, it's all the more worrying that people have formed such strong views when polls show that the British public say they don't know much about Islam but feel it oppresses women. They also say that what they do know about Islam has been picked up from the news, bringing us back full circle. In studying hate crime data compiled by Tell Mama, I found that there are unfortunately real world consequences when such reductive and divisive narratives prevail. For example, 
Islamophobic incidents rose by 375% in the week after Boris Johnson, the current British Prime Minister, infamously compared failed Muslim women to letterboxes in a Daily Telegraph news column. Talmama, who track Islamophobia, reported a spike in anti-Muslim hate as a direct result of Johnson's article, finding that racists were quoting him. In fact, in the three weeks after the article was published, 42% of Islamophobic incidents directly referenced Boris Johnson. Data also shows that 70% of hate crime against Muslims specifically targets failed Muslim women. To challenge these mainstream narratives and to bring niqabi women into the daily narrative beyond articles related to so-called burqa bans or stories about terrorism, I created the Daily Vell newspaper. A play on the British newspaper, the Daily Mail, which has the second highest readership of all national papers and many deemed to be sensational, racist, homophobic and sexist articles. The Daily Vale features exclusively niqab-wearing women, images of them doing everyday things and in settings we rarely see them in, for example, treating patients in a hospital or playing sports, images we would never see in the Daily Mail. Because of the stark disconnect between mass media representations of veiled women and how they present themselves, I was interested in authentic self-representations which I found on social media. While obviously the images I found can never represent all niqabi women, because they aren't the homogenous group they are presented to be, I feel that the images do nonetheless paint a completely different picture. The short film also incorporates the self-representational content I gathered and it challenges the usual narrative further. I wanted to depict Nagabi women being their truest selves and their own videos demonstrate this powerfully. Like others, Nagabi women are comfortable and confident in experimentation and expression, presenting the version they want to be known for and I wanted to share this with a wider audience. I find that face-failed women on social media like other groups subject to stereotypes, are countering stereotypes and are disrupting the meanings of representations of them. Because my research around the history of face failing was so valuable to my own understanding, the film juxtaposes factual, historical, political and contextual information about veiling alongside the self-representational content. Together, I hope all of this challenges us to consider what we think we know about Nikabi women.